Ladies and gentlemen, faculty, colleagues, staff, and alumni of the Aachen University, since we connected across the globe today, assalamu alaikum, welcome, and a very good morning, afternoon, and evening to everybody who is watching us. The Aachen University Hospital and the Department of Pediatrics and Child Health are extremely honored to welcome you to the fourth session of Conversations with the Experts. And we are indeed privileged to announce our first expert today. She's Dr. Sapna Putratkar. She's an Associate Professor of Anesthesiology and Critical Care Medicine, Pediatrics and Anesthesiology at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. Her areas of interest include sleep disturbances in critically ill children, pediatric delirium management and prevention, sedation of mechanically ventilated children, pediatric ICU rehab, and I'm sure you all know of the PICU up. So let's welcome Dr. Sapna and see what she has to tell us about illness does not mean stillness. Uh, the floor you. is all yours, Dr. Sapna. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Good morning for me. Good morning, everyone. Good evening to many of you. Uh, it's absolutely an honor and pleasure to be invited to speak to you on a topic that I am extremely passionate about, if anybody who knows me uh, knows that very well. So um, generally, this topic is creating a culture of mobility for critically ill children. But as you saw, the actual title is Illness Doesn't Mean Stillness. And hopefully by the end of this talk and, and segueing into Sebastian, my dear colleague's talk, um, you'll be able to put together that really we can create a culture uh, to optimize outcomes for critically ill children by doing some very easy things um, through interprofessional collaboration. So with no further ado, uh, I have no disclosures. And, you know, I just wanted to say it's, uh, it's, it's really incredible that I can, I can give a talk to such a global audience uh, with such incredible colleagues. And this is truly a, a global audience indeed. And so uh, we, it's indeed new times. And I just wanted to say, thankfully, this time around when I'm talking to all of you, I do not have COVID-19. I actually I had COVID-19 back in March. For those of you who follow me on social media, you're well aware. And I actually have given talks uh, from my bathroom uh, at that time, but luckily I am not in that situation anymore. So it's great to be with you all. Uh, I do um, do a lot of social media. I'm very passionate about it, as is my colleague Sebastian, who you'll hear from shortly. Uh, please do follow me on Twitter, at SapnaKMD. These are the two primary hashtags that will be critically important to the topics that I'll be talking about, hashtag PedsICU and hashtag ICU Rehab. But obviously, uh, we're also all thinking about COVID-19 every single day, and hashtag COVID-19 is another important hashtag that we have actually incorporated into the conversation about pediatric critical care. So to that end, myself and Sebastian, and many of our uh, pediatric critical care colleagues on Twitter have started curating the content uh, in order to make sure that you have the most up-to-date information. Uh, obviously, we can't publish this information fast enough in journals. Therefore, it's really important for us to share information directly. And social media has been one of the ways that we've done that. So all the Twitter content is actually available at this link that you see here. If you're not on Twitter, you can share it with your non-Twitter colleagues. And then the link below uh, is actually a search strategy that was created that automatically updates. I did not create this. I just created the shortened link for this. Uh, but actually, it'll give you all of the relevant COVID-19 pediatric critical care-based papers. So with no further ado, we're here to talk about illness doesn't mean stillness. And whenever I talk about this topic, it's really important for us to take a step back, right? We all care for critically ill children, and that's our every day. However, there are some fundamental aspects of growing up healthy as a child. So we all know children need good nutrition, they need shelter, they need love, and they need sleep, right? Those are the four basic tenets. However, all of those things are for naught if children don't have the ability to play, to interact with their environment, and um, really to develop that social and cognitive and emotional um, strength that they need in order to grow up into healthy adults. However, this is a picture that globally we all know well in the pediatric ICU, and this is a child that's cr very critically ill on several infusion pumps, a light on 24 hours above her head. She's on ECMO, uh, she's on dialysis, she's on the oscillator. Uh, so this is the culture that we often have in the ICU setting, and it, what it is is it's a culture of immobility, and I think you would all agree with me that we have seen this time and time again, 
So let's explore a little bit about why. Why do we have a culture of immobility for critically ill children? We all know immobility is not good. We personally don't feel good when we're immobile. We know that there are both short-term and long-term effects. And I love this table uh, figure from one of Karen Koo's papers uh, talking about the short and long-term burden of severe critical illness and how immobilization impacts that. Physical, non-physical disability, and other quality of life issues are severe. And this whole notion of ICU liberation or liberating patients from the critical care environment is really not a new concept. For example, it means a great deal to be put on their own feet in a short time rather than be confined to bed, having their weak backs and general debility increase rather than disappear after the operation which was to cure them. Folks, this is 121 years ago. We were talking about the notion that bed rest is bad. Again, in JAMA in 1944, an editorial by John Powers, I love the title, The Abuse of Rest as a Therapeutic Measure in Surgery. Prolonged bed rest is anatomically and physiologically unsound. Early restoration of medical and surgical patients to normal life is an essential feature of modern convalescent supervision. Again, over 70 years ago. In the world wars, the quickest way to get patients are back on the battlefield was to mobilize them. So what's changed? I think we all know that we have many, many amazing technologic and scientific advances to help us save critically ill patients' lives. Bed rest to promote stability and safety. Clearly, if a patient is in bed, they're less likely to be tachycardic, they're less likely to have tubes and lines pulled inadvertently. And then the continuous sedative and paralytic infusions have created an environment in which rest and recovery becomes the goal. We just give more medicine so they can rest, so that they can hopefully survive. This quote from Thomas Petty is really beautifully put. Um, he looked around his uh, medical intensive care unit back in 1998 and said, what I see these days are sedated patients lying without motion, appearing to be dead, except for the monitors that tell me otherwise. By being awake and alert, they could interact with family, feel human, sustain the zest for living, which is a requirement for survival. And I know that you would all agree that our goals as pediatric critical care staff is to sustain the zest for living, which is a requirement for survival. So let's talk a little bit about the patient experience. I think um, we've all had families that come in and they have this expectation that my child is critically ill, but this team is going to make them better and we're gonna leave the hospital and everything is going to be exactly as expected. They're gonna get better, we're gonna go back to our lives. But we all know that the reality is it's also a very tangled pathway. And often there are several steps forward, but many more steps back until they finally leave the hospital. And that life is a very different life often than the life that they led before their child was admitted to the ICU. The Society for Critical Care Medicine, fortunately in 2012, uh, recognized that um, post-intensive care syndrome uh, or new or worsening impairments in physical, cognitive, or mental health arising after ICU admission in survivors was a problem. And primarily, this was described in adults. So family picks and survivor post-intensive care syndrome with mental health, cognitive impairments, and physical impairments. And luckily, many, many of our amazing colleagues have started to explore this area in pediatrics, in children who have the longest lives to live and the most to lose in terms of debility and functional impairment after critical illness. So these are just a few of the papers that have come out recently. And I wanna highlight if there's one paper you want to focus on, this is a beautiful conceptual framework from Joseph Manning and team showing post-intensive care syndrome in pediatrics, that it's a complex phenomenon with an interdependency of physical health, cognitive health, emotional health, and social health and how all of those things interact with development to the developmental impact to impact the life of not only the child but their own family. 
My colleague Karen Chung in Canada has published some beautiful work to show us that it's not just the children that we typically think are going to have the most issues that have the most issues. It's also the children that were normal, healthy children before they became critically ill. So I know that prior to starting my work in this research, I had an implicit bias that the children with de severe developmental disabilities and functional impairments before they came to the hospital were the most likely to do the worst. However, uh, Dr. Chung's work, for example, showed that even children who had completely normal baseline function prior to getting sick, whether it was ARDS or a trauma, um, only 60% of them had achieved their pre-morbid function six months after being discharged from the ICU. So we can't just focus on survival anymore. Our focus must be on survivorship. The Society of Critical Care Medicine, again, has this ICU Liberation Task Force and created something easy to remember in terms of what you're going to hear from Sebastian, the less is more phenomenon. Can we come together with a mnemonic as easy as A, B, C, D, E, F to tackle all of these critically important non-pharmacologic measures to ensure that we liberate patients as quickly as possible? This is a VIP, a very important paper. I encourage you all to read this if you're interested in this topic area. Uh, this was a study of 15,000 adults across the United States uh, looking at whether the incorporation of this ABCDEF bundle, approaching pain, agitation, delirium, family engagement, early mobility, together as a bundle would have an impact on outcomes. And while we all know that p-values aren't everything, I think this, this paper says so much we can see across the board, the adjusted odds of so many important outcomes were significantly improved with just the simple incorporation of this non-pharmacologic bundle. ICU discharge, hospital discharge, shorter length of time to discharge, um, mortality was decreased. Mechanical ventilation duration, ICU readmission rates, all of the things that we care about and our patients and families obviously care about very much too. And you can see here that it wasn't just enough to talk about the ABCDF bundle, you actually had to do it. And the more you did it and the better you did it, the better your outcomes were. So you can see here in this, this mechanical ventilation, if you had 100% compliance with the ABCDF bundle, the adjusted probability or duration of mechanical ventilation decreased significantly compared to those who only had one component of the ABCDF bundle. So it's a synergistic bundle. So you might be asking, okay, that's great, Sapna, what about the kids? Why can't we just take the ABCDF bundle and slap it on all the um, uh, electronic medical records in the hospital for children and utilize it? Well, we have a lot of challenges in caring for critically ill kids. A, we worry about heterogeneity and ages and development. The same nurse is taking care of a two-week-old in one bed spot who just came off of ECMO, for example, and then another bed spot maybe dealing with a 17-year-old who overdosed on medications. What if the tube falls out? We don't want inadvertent extubations. We don't want central lines and chest tubes to get lost. And we also worry with children, what if they remember? What if they remember these invasive interventions that we're subjecting them to? And I'll, I'll, I'll leave you to read this comic, but I think that many of us often approach sedation with this view. And I was definitely a culprit to this, and I occasionally still probably am. When I see orders to titrate sedation to comfort, I'm certain that they mean my comfort. And again, a still patient is an easy patient. It's very easy for us to over-sedate patients in order to maintain safety and stability. So how did I become interested in this area? Well, back in 2013 at Johns Hopkins, uh, I looked around along with many of my interprofessional colleagues and noticed all our patients were over-sedated. We were rapidly escalating drugs, starting patients on methadone and Valium. We had no consistent sedation language. We were just saying, oh, this child's flying off of the bed, may have some more fentanyl, for example. Rehab was an afterthought. We were not inviting our PT or OT colleagues to the bedside until it was absolutely something that we thought of. For example, four or five days later when we're done talking about the blood pressure and the heart rate being um, unstable. Restraints were the rule, not the exception. We weren't discussing delirium at all. Benzos and Benadryl were being used to improve sleep, and we'll talk about that shortly. And family were observers. We invited them on rounds, but we did not actively engage them in the process at the bedside. 
We quickly learned though, um, and again, I hope you all learn from the mistakes that, that I and my colleagues made in trying to explore this area, that you can't deal with all of these things in silos. So, you know, it's great. You create a task force to deal with sedation. You create a task force to come up with a sleep hygiene protocol, delirium. However, these things are not siloed. They're so intimately interconnected a delirious child likely has significant sleep disturbance, likely has had a significant exposure to opioids and is less safe to mobilize. So again, all of those things immediately interconnected. So let's talk about really for me and where my entire research pathway started for those of you who are just getting started as junior faculty or trainees. Uh, for me, this whole area of focus started with sleep. So why, do, why should we care about sleep? Well, I just, uh, it's, it's 8 a.m. for me here in the United States and I had a wonderful night's sleep and I feel great and ready to have a wonderful day. And that's because sleep is integral to all of our organ systems. Thermoregulation, respiratory, cardiovascular, GI, immune defenses, we're more likely to get sick if we're sleep deprived and the endocrine system. And most importantly for our pediatric patients, they are going through the most rapid phase of their neurocognitive developments. Therefore, the first year of life and the majority of our patients who are long stay patients in the PICU are under the age of two. Therefore, these children, they're ones who are going this rapid brain development and sleep is really a marker of how rapidly their brain's developing. There's a reason that a one-year-old sleeps very differently than a six-year-old. And ironically though, even though sleep is so critically important for children, it's our adult colleagues who incorporated sleep into their guidelines. So in 2013, they just had the PAD guidelines, the Pain, Agitation, Delirium guidelines. And now in 2018, it's the PAD IS, the Immobility and Sleep Disruption um, guidelines. Interesting. So what about our patients? Are they sleeping? Well, you know, these two children have their eyes closed, so seemingly they might be sleeping. But the answer is they're actually not. So sedation does not equal sleep. If you take away anything from this, natural restorative sleep is very different from the sedatives that we administer. And you can see here in the top row, these are children with normal slow wave activity at night. You can see this beautiful homeostatic regulation of the first non-REM period and the second non-REM period that decreases over the course of the night. And then on the bottom row are our ICU patients. And as you can see here, there's really no ultradian or um, circadian rhythmicity in terms of their activity. We're all well aware that there are many risk factors for sleep disturbances, and I won't belabor all of these, but there are many reasons that kids don't sleep well in the hospital. And back um, a few years ago now, we actually did a study, a systematic review, looking at the word sleep and pick you in the same paper. That was it. That was the search strategy. Are the words sleep and pediatric critical care in any way associated? And we were only able to find nine publications ever. These aren't RCTs. These were all observational studies, um, except for these four that came from the same RCT. So there were five observational, four from the same RCT, looking at burn patients getting Ambien versus haloperidol. And um, two of the studies used subjective assessment. When we surveyed our colleagues about noise and light, Less than 15% of my colleagues were aware of any efforts to optimize sleep in the critically ill setting. So these are basic interventions like lighting interventions, noise reduction, et cetera. And then finally, 85% of our colleagues at the time, and again, this was back uh, about five years ago, were using opioids and benzodiazepines as their first line. And I hope that that number has changed. However, a significant proportion of our colleagues are still using opioid and benzodiazepine infusions as their first line agents for mechanical ventilation. So what's wrong with that? Obviously, opioids and benzos have a significantly important role in the critical care setting. We cannot do without them. However, Benzos and opioids are also deleterious for sleep quality. So you may sleep or fall asleep when you take these medications. However, the quality of that sleep decreases significantly. And we know that benzodiazepines are an independent risk factor for the development of delirium. Um, so I can't have you all raise your hands on the Zoom call right now. However, uh, what I always ask when I do this in person is for people to raise their hands to tell us when the most common time is for x-rays in their ICU. Uh, so 7 to 10, 10 to 5, or 5 to 7. And at least in the U.S., in the vast majority of units that we ask, the best time to do x-rays per the units is 5 a.m. to 7 a.m. What is the most common time for bats? 
again, in the United States at least, 10 p.m. to 5 a.m. is the most common time that we give bats in the unit. So why is that? Is that our, should that really be our normal? Bats at 2 a.m., daily x-rays at 5 a.m., labs at midnight. Really what we've done is we've hit the easy button. And Sebastian will talk about this more in terms of less is more. We are doing so many interventions for our patients and not being thoughtful about how it really impacts them. And a lot of this is about the convenience of our own staff. It's convenient for me to have an x-ray done at 5 a.m. so that I have it in time for my rounds in the morning. That doesn't mean that I can't change completely the way that I do rounds so that that x-ray at 5 a.m. can maybe get delayed to 7 a.m. So we need to be thinking about how we change our normal. Because what we've done is essentially created a vicious cycle, right? So a child's not sleeping, so they're given more sedation. Their sedation needs escalate because we all know that a fentanyl drip of one turns into a fentanyl drip of two mites per kilo per hour the next day or even the next hour. Their sleep quality worsens because of these medications. They get delirious and more agitated and we say they're not quote unquote sleeping. So what do we do? We give them more sedation. And before you know it, these children are getting started on methadone, Valium, Clonidine, so that we can actually wean them off of these other medications because of their physiologic dependence. This is a hot off the press paper that actually came out this week. Uh, my colleague Dave Procaccini, a pharmacist at Hopkins, actually um, recognized that we were having significant issues with uh, PRN medications. So those medications that we write for the nurses to administer uh, per their uh, purview when a child is agitated. But the problem is when the prescribers were ordering these medications, we weren't saying what the indication was. So fentanyl was getting used for um, sedation often or a, a opioid or benzodiazepine that was being used for the wrong indications. And what did it lead to? Over sedation and occasionally errors. So um, in this paper, I hope you'll check it out. Uh, we offer a very practical approach to optimizing PRN orders and making sure that not only sedatives and analgesics, but also neuromuscular blockade, which we all know also contributes to stillness, literally, um, can be optimized and not overused and used for the right indications. So you might say, okay, Sapna, that's fine. Sleep is a problem in the PICU, but maybe after kids leave the PICU in the critical illness environment, they're going to be fine their sleep will get better. So this is work that we did a few years ago, looking at sleep-wake patterns using actigraphy or accelerometry watches. And interestingly, what we found is regardless of whether you're in the PICU or on the floor, uh, we couldn't find a difference in day or night activity in approximately 40% of the subjects. 40% of the subjects could not tell the difference between day and night in terms of their activity. So clearly problems that start in the PICU persist and what we happens when they go home, we're still learning. So you might say, well, melatonin. Melatonin's a great drug, right? It's uh, generally over the counter in the US. It's uh, openly available. You can buy it at any of our drug stores. And um, I've seen many of my pediatric ICU patients and also others patients automatically started on melatonin for this notion of sleep promotion. So why not start using melatonin for every single pa patient in the PICU if it's a pretty benign drug? Well, the systematic review showed that we still do not have any objective evidence to demonstrate that melatonin is helpful specifically for sleep promotion. Out of 6,000 abstracts looking for non-anesthetic indications of melatonin in the hospital for children, we only identified 13 studies. They were all in neonates and none of them focused on sleep. They all focused on inflammation, and many of my colleagues now are actually pursuing work on COVID-19 and the role of melatonin. Um, but for sleep, still has not been demonstrated in the hospital to have an impact. So what have we learned? We've learned that sleep is important. It's a marker of brain development. Sleep severely fragmented when children are admitted to the hospital. So what does the behavioral phenotype of sleep present as? Well, it presents as delirium. So let's talk a little bit about delirium. Um, in case you didn't know, there is a World Delirium Awareness Day. It was on, um, it was in March of this year, ironically, right before COVID-19 really took hold across the globe. Um, so I encourage you to check that out in the coming years. Delirium is a very complex diagnosis. Um, it's not enough just to say a patient's delirious because they're agitated and trying to pull things out. There's hyperactive delirium and hypoactive delirium, but the hallmark, and this is a beautifully written paper, um, the hallmark of delirium is that there's a disturbance in attention and a disturbance in awareness. 
If a patient is not inattentive, they're very unlikely to be delirious. And it's an acute change that can wax and wane. So can babies be delirious? Well, let me show you. This is a, from Heidi Smith, my colleague at Vanderbilt. Oh, sorry, let me get this. Look at the picture. So this is a baby without delirium. You can see he's tracking beautifully, looking at the picture. Is this a cow? And this is a baby with delirium. Can you see the picture? Look at it, yeah. Is this a sweet boy? You see the picture? And this is the same baby later without delirium. Hey, is this a truck? So the most important thing to note with that baby who was delirious, that baby wasn't a problem for anyone. That baby wasn't trying to pull things out, wasn't playing with his trach, was not problematic from a safety perspective. However, it was clearly inattentive, hypoactive delirium. So if we don't address it and don't recognize it, we can't treat it and move forward. Again, hypoactive delirium example, and the majority of our patients have hypoactive, not hyperactive delirium. This is Micah after um, a heart transplant. You can see here Micah is not delirious in this picture, but this is Micah with hypoactive delirium. Um, his family will tell you that the scariest time in his hospitalization was not when he crashed onto ECMO after his transplant. It was this moment when they felt that they had lost him, when he was staring at the ceiling and not making any comment and was completely inattentive. Delirium is everyone's problem. It's not just the physicians, it's not just the nurses. In our team, the rehab specialists, the child life team, the social workers, everyone knows how to recognize delirium. And we come together at Hopkins to talk about it across disciplines because all of these disciplines have so much to share. This is a very morbid but important way to remember all of the differential diagnosis for delirium um, in the PICU. Again, if you look at this, you won't forget what could potentially be causing a patient's new onset delirium. And again, we could do a whole two hour talk on delirium right here. So in the interest of time, I'll just, just mention that the things that we really need to be thinking about in terms of risk factors are physical restraints, mechanical ventilation, narcotics, and benzodiazepines. Those are independent risk factors for um, delirium prevalence in our international study. And those of you who know the delirium literature know that West Ely is, uh, is one of the um, leaders internationally and pioneers in this area. And one of the quotes that will always resonate with me from um, Wes is that a positive delirium screen after never, uh, several negative screens is a warning sign for impending badness. So we're not just screening in order to say that there's delirium and moving on. We're screening in order to change things by figuring out why patients delirious in the first place. And I can't tell you how many times I've seen a patient be not delirious, not delirious, not delirious, delirious, and then their blood culture comes back positive several hours later. So basics of delirium prevention, again, less is more. I'll let Sebastian talk about this, but there's so much that we can do that is non-pharmacologic. So where do we go from here? Again, the topic is illness doesn't mean stillness and pre-COVID-19, we knew that bed rest is bad. We've known this for a long time. And in adults, we know that uh, bed rest causes ho more hospital acquired complications, longer hospital length of stay, and long-term impaired physical function. And since we are, this is a COVID-19 series, I wanted to mention that, you know, with COVID-19, the recipe for physical impairment is drastically increased and um, proliferated because not only do we have all the usual suspects of sedation and mechanical ventilation and bed rest, the social isolation, the visitor restrictions, the PPE conservation, clinicians not going in to see the patients as much because of those restrictions, nurses being redeployed to different units and not having access to mobility equipment makes things extraordinarily challenging. So we have an altered healthcare system, right? We Generally, we used to have just the purple arrow where patients would go home, go to outpatient rehab. But with COVID-19, we're learning that those issues also feed back into the hot inpatient environment again because the long-term morbidity is so severe. And we're still learning a lot in kids. 
So I mentioned what our culture was in fall of 2013 of immobility. And what was our goal? So when we looked at this culture and we wanted to change it, we wanted it to be every kid every day. We didn't want it to just be the pediatric cardiac ICU patients or the neurosurgery patients. Every kid, every day, how do we change culture? We wanted to get the experts to the bedside early. We wanted to make sure people know that no child is ever too sick to turn away the PT or the OT. Analgesia first and then sedation if needed. That sedation did not have to be an absolute. We wanted to ask kids and families what they needed. What did they want? And we also wanted to focus on sleep hygiene and delirium prevention as a conduit to get patients mobilized more. So what was the cost? Um, I can guarantee you and tell you that there was absolutely no funding or money to start a program like Pick You Up. So, and I'll talk about Pick You Up in detail. When we came together to try to change culture, this was what the cost was. And that was interprofessional collaboration to promote culture change from champions across disciplines in the PICU. We use this translating research into practice model. I encourage you to look up this paper. I had never done a QI project before, so this was a very straightforward approach for me to take on with my team to try to tackle this problem. And so Pick You Up was born. So first we came up with a cool name that was catchy, that was very important. It's a structured and interdisciplinary program that's integrated into the routine care of every kid every day. And what we wanted to do was provide a standardized mechanism to increase activity. That was the simple goal. Let's get kids moving more. We wanted to first emphasize, and for any of you who are starting early mobility programs in your own hospital, that you have to emphasize with your staff that ambulation is not the goal for everyone. In fact, the vast majority of your patients are not going to be ambulating. You can start with the most critically ill patients with just normalization of the sleep-wake cycle. It's a spectrum increasing the head of bed, range of motion, and ambulation, if appropriate, can be considered. Pick You Up has multiple levels in order to create a shared mental model. This is all in the 2016 paper in PCCM um, that's open access, so please do check it out. Um, and you can see here, it's just based on clinical criteria so that everyone knows what the expectation is and what the minimum activity level is, um, which is here. Sorry, this box is a little off, but what I wanted to show is that the focus here is that sleep hygiene interventions are for everybody. So regardless of how sick you are, everyone has a sleep hygiene promotion intervention. We were able to show that more of our patients were getting PT sessions prior to discharge from the PICU. The median number of mobilization activities doubled. And most importantly, in this initial single center QI study, we showed that there was a 0% adverse event rate and ET tube ambulation increased from 0% to 10%. And since then, a multitude of other papers have begun to come out focused specifically on pediatric early mobility and its impact on outcomes, as this liver transplantation paper has shown. So we created a culture of mobility and we had been successful and we we're very excited about this. So what next? Well, my next question um, was, are we the only ones that needed to create a mobility culture? I thought I knew the answer to that, but I wanted to confirm. So it was really important that we understood the global landscape of acute rehab. So in the last few minutes, I'd like to summarize some of the data from this hot off the press paper that uh, came out both in, um, in critical care medicine for the US study and for the EU study um, in critical care, which is the prevalence of acute rehab for kids in the PICU. So Park PICU, as we call it, is a two-day point prevalence study that we're conducting around the world. If any of you are interested in conducting this in your area and it's not listed here, please let me know. Um, basically, we looked at all comers on these two days that were admitted greater than 72 hours. This is an example of how many sites were involved across the United States. We had 1,800 patients. And I'll summarize the US data. The EU data was very similar with some differences, uh, but in the interest of time, what do we find? We found that 35% of patient days included a PT or OT provided mobility event. However, 19% of patient days, they were completely immobile, completely immobile. Who was at risk for a delayed PT or OT consult? It was the patients with higher baseline function. And who had lower odds of PT or OT provided mobility? Surprisingly, females did independently associated with less PTROT provided mobility and younger patients, the patients who comprise the vast majority of our units. What does promote mobility? Parents present at the bedside. Not a surprise, but important to demonstrate 
endotracheal intubation, and interestingly, having a Foley catheter significantly decreased your odds of out of bed mobility. And again, early mobility is generally safe. 4% of 4,700 activities included a safety event, and those are most commonly a transient change in vital signs. And um, so we also have infographics in multiple languages. This is the one in Arabic that we just published, and there's more to come. So this is just a graph showing, again, that the children with no or mild disability were the ones getting the delayed consults. And then this is critically important. Nurses and families are the cornerstone of PICU mobility. We have to empower our nursing and families to mobilize patients because the rehab team is not at the bedside 24 hours a day, but often the nurses and the families are. So in the last few minutes, I'd like you to help me decide whether we are letting kids be kids. You be the judge. By being an awake and alert, are we helping children to interact with family, feel human, and sustain the zest for living, which is a requirement for survival? So first, this case study, starting slow with room air. So this is a two-year-old female status post Fontan on post-op day number one. And you can see that we had just started our pick you up program. So we're like, we're going to get you out of bed and you're going to walk, Sydney. And you can see here, Sydney is not very excited about this entire prospect. She has two chest bulb suctions hanging off her little body with blood filled in them. She has this pump that's hang following her everywhere she goes. She threw a tantrum in the middle of the hallway. But again, family engagement. Her family members said, she went into the operating room in this little car. Are you able to find that? Because she loved it. And we said, okay, we can do our best. And this is what happened. So great. <laughs> I want you to note that she's wearing her own sandals. Her parents brought her sandals from home and she put them on. And that made a world of difference because it was a little piece of awesome. home. And these are the simple things that we can do for our patients to make it better. And you can see here, she brought us our own car uh, for the PICU as a gift. This is a nine-year-old with alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma. She's intubated for airway protection, no benzo, low dose morphine PCA. She's the first patient that we walked in the hospital, in the PICU with an endotracheal tube. And we celebrated, we celebrated this moment, but she was the ideal candidate because she was neurologically completely intact. Her family members were supportive and she was able to be on minimal sedation. It's not just the patients that have developmental delay that um, can do this. We can actually also have patients, I mean, sorry, normally um, functioning patients. We can actually have patients with developmental delay. And this young man's having sensory stimulation. And relationships matter. So our family members in the PICU, they get to know each other, family members of other patients. They go to the kitchen, they go talk in the hallways. and. This baby had never left her room in months and months of being in the ICU, but Micah, who you met before, needed to go for a walk after his transplant, and he would, did not want to do that. He was not in the mood. However, one mother said to the other, does Micah want to take Everly on a walk? The next thing you knew, Micah was taking this baby on a walk, and everybody won. So what about our youngest patients? Well, we can do this for our youngest patients too. And even just the act of holding your baby, that's the most important thing that a mother can do, um, can be critically important, not only for the patient, but also for our family members. And another important point to remember is intubated babies can cry just like healthy babies. We need to remind our staff, our trainees, everyone of that, that sedation is not always the answer for a crying baby. And in the last minute, I just wanted to show you briefly that social media can be used to promote all sorts of things that you all are doing, the incredible work you're doing across the globe. Um, and I love this quote, it's evident that we have much to learn from each other in the cycle of local to global communities of practice can be fueled by leveraging social media. So I'll just point out this paper that we published last month in PCCM. Uh, this is free for download as well showing that um, actually we were able to disseminate COVID-19 information very rapidly using a dedicated social media strategy, which I mentioned to you earlier. And you can see here, these are just a few of the people, and Sebastian is also one of these uh, folks who are, are leading the conversation and having an impact. This is just one month of PEDS ICU data. So you can see here, it's absolutely extraordinary. So in one month, we've had 32 million impressions. So that means 32 million times content for PEDS ICU has been viewed 
on social media, on Twitter. You can see Sebastian here is in the top row of our leaderboard and I'm sure you'll recognize, oh, there's someone I recognize as well. So you can see here that um, our colleagues are doing an incredible job of disseminating info and I hope you'll join the conversation. And we've used it to promote what we're doing from an early mobility perspective so that we can inspire other teams to do the same in their own units. And you can see here, this is Jackie Ong from Singapore who showed one of their patients going to Starbucks in response to one of our patients going outside. And this is from Brazil and from um, Scotland. So the final case study before I um, will stop and um, cede over to Sebastian is a seven-year-old with a 35% total body surface area burns. She had severe inhalational injury, had a left BKA, respiratory failure, um, was in our ICU for 662 days. This is the case report from her um, story. And we essentially got her traped early, decreased her sedation, got PT and OT to the bedside with close family engagement. We also took note of who these family members were. What, what was this family before this happened to them, this tragic event? They're dairy farmers. So <laughs> the father actually was able to bring the cow that um, Reese had not seen in an, a long, long time to the hospital. That's a whole story in itself, but it was a very critically important moment for her. This was her first walk. Ready. It was the first time we had walked a patient on ECMO. You can see she has a prosthesis. She lost her leg as a result of the a sepsis. Smile. I saw that. <laughs> and there's about 10 people involved in this mobility event. She's doing amazing. So does that happen every day? No, it does not. But it happens when our team can make it happen based on the acuity of the unit. And then next thing you know, she was riding a bike on ECMO. Please note that we're all pediatricians, so safety first. She was wearing a helmet. So take home points here, and I, I'm sorry, I went a little over my time. It is never too early. That's the key. We can always make changes as soon as a patient hits our doors to make sure illness doesn't mean stillness. We need to value each other's expertise. We need to be consistent in the care that we provide. There's no easy button. This takes hard work, but it is possible. We can focus on pain control first before we go to sedation. We can start low and go slow. We don't have to escalate infusions as quickly as we do. Sleep and nutrition, I did not get into nutrition today, critically important and pushing the envelope safely is the most important thing we can do. And we need to celebrate all of our successes, big and small, because we have so much work to do. Every success counts toward that. Please follow us on social media, at Pick You Up and have Hopkins Pick You Up on Instagram. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sapna. This was a beautiful narration, and uh, we just didn't realize we're already 45 minutes down. I want to congratulate you and your team on revolutionizing the culture of mobility, I think. And I think it's a beautiful, beautiful concept, and uh, hats off to you guys, you know, for uh, spreading it across the globe. Thank so, um, yeah, and I've actually been a fan of you, you know, ever since I listened to your TED Talk, that was probably like two years ago. And each concept of yours resonated very, very well. So thank you once again. So next we have uh, Dr. Sebastian Gonzalez with us. And he's a pediatric intensivist from Uruguay and also happens to be the chair of LARED Network. That's PQ Latin American Collaborative Network. And he's going to be talking to you about how the COVID-19 has impacted children, what the ramifications have been, and uh, to avoid iatrogenic harm in children during the pandemic. Welcome, Dr. Sebastian. Hello. Well, thank you so much. I will start sharing my screen. Okay. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. Well, th thank you very much, my colleagues from and friends from Pakistan. It's a uh, real honor to be here with you. It's been awesome to listen to Sabna's talk. Uh, well, these are, these are my disclosures. I have no conflicts of interest with this talk. As a presentation, I'm from this tiny country in South America. As, you can, as Homer shows there, 
We are between two giants like Argentina and Brazil. We are a tiny country with three million and a half inhabitants. So if you listen about this country, you you can find her, find me there. And you we are famous as well for football, for soccer. So we 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 are there if you need us. So for a start. This talk is about an invitation to think about our PQ care, daily care, from another point of view. As you may know, uh, iatrogenic means iatros from the Greek physician and genan as a product of. So iatrogenics is all those things related to the care we give. It may be counterintuitive to think that we can uh, do harm to our patients, but it's the hard reality. We can, we can even kill children. Uh, so the invitation is to 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 share with you this paper from John Marshall, from the giant John Marshall from Canada. I read this paper uh, like ten years ago when I was a fellow. Uh, and I read there, as you can see there, that critical illness is, in a way, a iatrogenic disorder. We're used to, to think about critical, critical illness from the insult and the, respo the host response to that insult. But we are not really used to think critical illness from the doctor perspective, from the standpoint that we doctors shape the way the critical Ill patients uh, are discharged from the ICU. So iatrogenesis, this process, uh, can, can be in any patient, but particularly in children. We know that children are the most vulnerable uh, kind of person, you know, uh, to this kind of life-threatening complications. It is not easy to talk about iatrogenesis. It is distressing for us. We can feel guilt. We can feel fears when we talk about iatrogenic disorders. Uh, but we, we must always remember that uh, one of the most important bioethical principles of non-maleficence is first, do no harm. It's not to do to do the good things, but always try to do no harm. So we have an ethical obligation to respond and to study iatrogenesis. As you can see there, an entire number from the American uh, Journal of Ethics dedicated to this topic in pediatrics. So I invite you to read it as well. As Sabna told us before, we are living an era of a huge paradigm shift. If you can see on the left, we have one of the main textbooks that we from South America read and study PQ, Pediatric Intensive Care. As you can see there, I was uh, learning in that environment. You can see a child, if you can, in the middle of a surrounding full of machines, full of technology, and that, that was our paradigm. But uh, slowly it has been changed, and you can see on the right an entire change of the front page of the textbooks. So you may, may have listened to the less is more paradigm. It's a way to approach iatrogenesis that maybe less is more. It is not doing nothing, you know? It's keeping at the bedside and think about the harm that, that we could eventually do to our patients. That would finally, eventually improve the value. I mean, the, the relation between the quality of care we, get, we deliver and the costs, both humans and economic. 
that's the value equation so important to, to have in mind when you practice medicine. There are many papers. Almost every single intervention that we are used to make and to do in the PICU field, we have transitioned slowly from more intervention to less, thus redu the reducing the autogenicity. You can see that in the fluid resuscitation, septic shock, blood transfusion, and almost every single phase of our treatments. To give you an example, this is not coincident that today I'm giving this talk with Pakistani colleagues. I prepared this talk a year ago and I stumbled into this paper from Caleb. And there he wrote without, that without proper training, invasive mechanical ventilation is life-saving machine, but can be a weapon, a weapon of mass destruction. I will be a little, I will go a little bit further, you know, and say that it is not the machine, but the way we use it. It is not the machine who do, does the harm, but us doctors. But I don't think nowadays a paper will be accepted if, if I write, for example, that we doctors can become a mass destruction professional. So you can make diagnosis retrospectively of iatrogenesis. Look at this paper published in the 70s. Colleagues from that time recommended to put bilateral chest tube thoracostomies for patients with acute respiratory failure as a prophylactic method against tension and motorex. That was iatrogenesis. I usually say in a provocative way that tubing and mechanical ventilation in its invasive form is going to be extinct in a, in, in a, a year from now. Perhaps we meet again in 20 years from now, we will say, well, I started, I was a fellow when we put plastic tubes in the trachea of children as an anecdote. Well, I think things are changing for good and that's the way we are moving on. Look at the cartoon of the left. That was a present from a mentor here in Uruguay. He gave me this cartoon, who is an, which shows a pediatrician running after a child with a laryngoscope in his left hand. He wanted to tube them. I mean, that was common practice in neonatology those days. Today, we have editorials papers who ask, which ask, do we really need to intubate? So abandoning slowly intubation, it's, a, it's a, and, and becoming intubation a practice from the past, it's inadvertently a, a way to tackle iatrogenesis. We know when I was a fellow, I'm like telling the story of my profession, but when I was a fellow in my PACU, every single child was intubated. If you compare it with what we have now, I would say that almost two out of 10 patients are intubated today. Whereas in those times, like 10 years ago, with a short period of time, intubation was the norm. The fellows were on each shift intubating one more put a central IV, that was common practice, and that's changed dramatically. If you compare those times with nowadays, the machines and the technology was pretty similar. Pretty similar. What changed was our approach to the critically ill children. You can see this phenomena of abandoning mechanical ventilation invasive me mechanical ventilation and reports from France and you can see on the left the abandoning the progressive abandoning of 
impressive mechanical ventilation. Same happened in Australia. The most common pediatric disease like bronchiolitis. So, Sabna talked before a lot about these syndromes. They have withdrawal syndromes, are for sure iatrogenic. These breaking, by, breaking bad babies can develop as well delirium, and delirium is a complication acquired in the hospital. You can, you can think about it, you have to think about delirium, think about the, every single intervention that you must, that can pose a threat to the, to the development of delirium. So, think about another example. What about iatrogenic anemia? Can we prevent this? Of course we can. Uh, there is an estimate that almost 25 million liters of blood are, goes to the sewer each year. So, think about each blood sample, if you will need it or not. Now, we have a new normal, seven grams per deciliter. That's our new normal. When I was a fellow, I used to transfuse with red blood transfusions, just looking at the kid. When we were resuscitating kids, transfusion was the norm. Now, we for sure know, and we have evidence to show that our new normal of seven is safe for children and transfusions have dropped down to almost, uh, or have run down a lot, dropped down a lot. Let me give you another example. How many kids might be walking down the streets with deafness, which was born in the PACU admission? Well, you can tackle this. You can work on this with your team, thinking about iatrogenesis, avoiding a toxicity of furosemide of Lasix can be done. You can drop down the autotoxicity to zero. If you think about it and you just administer the drug in a different way. What about families? Families are partners. And I was a fellow, families were out of the PICU. Fortunately, these have changed. And today, families are part of the, the team. They are with, with us, taking care, or taking care of their own child. They have the right to be with us. And we know for sure that we can diminish errors, hospital errors, and they are pretty good helping us with adverse event surveillance during pediatric admissions. As Sabna uh, showed us before, families may save lives if, we, we, if they are part of the core bundle from the ABCDF bundle. Remember that. So what happened this 2020? What happened with coronavirus? Well, we know for sure that pra practices have changed. We changed in this year towards a more aggressive acute care. For example, a lower threshold for invasive mechanical ventilation has been proposed, especially during the first months of the pandemic. Fears for aerosolization risks uh, mandated from some key opinion leaders the proscription of high flow nasal cannula, non invasive ventilation. Families are away from the ICU. And another proposal, which for sure uh, should have uh, made shiver Sabna, was that patients should be left quiet. So heavy sedation, the uh, spread prescription of neuromuscular blockade was proposed as a default uh, procedure now of course 
off-label prescription of non-testing medication, let me remember that pharmacon, it's a Greek word, which it's, has an, uh, an ambiguous uh, meaning. It means both remedy and poison. So when you use non-tested medications, you can start giving a poison to your patient. You never know until you test it in well-designed studies. So why this has happened? Well, doctors are humans. We are usually prone to this kind of bias, the intervention bias. The do something syndrome, you know, uh, you have uh, you have a critical patient, you are in the midst of, of a pandemic, so you must do something. This is related and interlinked with self-satisfaction and professional fulfillment. And of course, it is part of defensive medicine. Well, I protect myself from my practice suits. Uh, we even use uh, some procedures, intervention, both diagnosis, diagnostic and therapeutic interventions. Many therapies we were proven to be not useful or even harmful, but we go on and we continue to use it. Those called medical reversals. So we have to recognize the first step towards overcoming this kind of bias is to recognize that we do these kind of things. In an editorial from days ago, one of the masters of evidence-based medicine, Gordon Wyatt, wrote this editorial. And he wrote that we have both sides during the pandemic. On the one hand, uh, both sides like that they work like a paradox. On the one hand, we have unprecedented levels of scientific and political cooperation. But on the other, governments, health institutions, physicians have advocated, advocated for unproven management strategies inconsistent with rational evidence-based reasoning. He proposed that prudence generally dictates that we should not implement interventions when only very low quality evidence exists. This is because the result uh, will be, uh, if you use non-tested therapies, the net, uh, the net end, digamos, will be uh, harm. So we have an example with our group. We made this uh, uh, epidemiological study. So we are thrilled to, to have gathered more than 60 PICUs around the globe in the cake study, but check this out. We found in the first report of our study that three out of 17 children had peri-intubation arrest. This is markedly higher than what is suspected in our common practice. And we know that at least one of these cases resulted from unfamiliar protective equipment and changes in the practices of the intubation processes. So clinicians today must consider the risk before intubating this kind of children, particularly because, uh, and I suggest you to use and stick what you know to do. Don't try to improvise. This case was a case that they, it was a great team of professionals, but they were, recommended to use a video learning scope and they were not used to it to use it so that might be a dark sign or dark side of this this procedure so we gather a team with anna camporesi from italy he is fortunately on holiday today he couldn't join us we have franco diaz from chile and christopher caro from the us and myself we agreed to, to write this viewpoint. We have the ethical obligation to protect children during this pandemic. And how, how we think about it? Well, we 
recommend to move away from eminent based medicine. We know for sure that in the first time, during the first times of the pandemic, emotions and anecdotes prevailed over science. We are for sure that many, many events could be, could be explained by Dr. Jemich Harm. We know today we are having a pandemic of delirium, to make an example. So if you see at the fourth box, you know, the whole trajectory of the PZU admission, changing practices in respiratory support could lead to unnecessary intubation, avoiding non-invasive ventilation and half low nasal canal could pose a harm to people, to children. Same happens with off-label drugs. We have no pediatric data. So the high, we, we will have a high risk benefit ratio. Isolation from families are a hard reality. We have to work on this to overcome this isolation. Families have to be with their critical age children. We know for sure that some complications from mechanical ventilation will surge, like nosocomial infections, delirium, withdrawal syndrome. So uh, we advise to have this kind of approach, the sentencivist approach. The sentencivism is an approach which emerged from social media with a bunch of colleagues which think about that we, in the ICU field we have to be minimally invasive, we have to be maximally attentive and aggressively gentle. We have to tolerate risk, we have to embrace randomness and accept the uncertainty which is linked with our profession. We have to accept that we have no magic ballots in this pandemic. We have to avoid rushing into novel therapies. We, today we know that sudden change of practice is hazardous and prone to iatrogenesis. And we have, we should all come back. We cannot let this pandemic to, to transport us to 10 years ago. So the less is more approach should come again with us. So thinking in iatrogenic harm is this. This is a picture from my PACU. We have less is more. We have to go on pursuing the evidence-based practice. We have to embrace research as a standard of care. We have to engage family like we were doing a month ago. And we have to embrace intensivism. I advise, my advice to read to this colleague from the UK, perhaps many of you have read this amazing book, which wrote a lot about iatrogenesis. So for the end, just to remember that we know, I know, that some, sometimes nothing is the hardest thing to do. Thank you very much for this opportunity to share my thoughts with you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sebastian. Um, I think this was um, probably one of the most uh, warranted topics that everybody needed to be sensitized to. And I think it was very, very well curated. Thank you uh, once again. And I think we all should aim you know, towards Zen-tensivism. <laughs> so um, let's move on to questions now. So myself and Dr. Bas would be moderating questions. We do have quite a couple of questions for both of you. So um, I would like to invite Dr. Bas to take in the first questions yeah so uh, i would like to thank you both of you for uh, amazing talks and eye opening and uh, thank you very much so uh, sapna i have a question uh, for you 
to begin with. So uh, I know uh, hearing to your talk, it, it it's always looks like that it was a smooth journey, <laughs> uh, but it wasn't. It it cannot be a smooth journey. So uh, the uh, one of the audience asked how uh, you won the confidence of the team. For example, the nurses that uh, what you are gonna do is how mobilizing patient won't be harmful. So because uh, all everyone around is like it can be harmful for the patient what if the patient becomes unstable in between the corridor etc so can you elaborate on few of the strategies to uh, gain confidence of the team that let's do it together and yes we can do it absolutely that's that's the most important question right because the culture change won't happen if if people are scared or worried and obviously our critical care staff, they're already stressed. They already have very high workload. Um, so it's critically important that you make sure that everyone knows that they are equally a part of this process and that you're just not dictating that, we're, okay, we're gonna do this mobility program and everyone's gonna get on board. So the most important aspect of this was to start with you know, the quote unquote lowest hanging fruit. So we did not roll out this program and say, boom, one day we're not doing pick you up and the next day we are. What we started doing in the, in the year before pick you up really rolled out is started to use some pilot patients, if you will. So for example, the, 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 the young woman who was in the little car uh, in the hallway, um, you know, that was something that we had never done before. It doesn't look like it's something so fancy or crazy. She was not excavated. She was on room air, you know, but again, the notion of getting a fontan out of their room on, you know, within 16 hours of surgery was new. And so we had a nurse that was a senior nurse that was really invested and wanted to try it. So we said, okay, let's take this opportunity and let's do this. And it went well. And once we did that, we took pictures, we shared the story, we celebrated with the rest of the staff, um, but we know in no way made it the expectation that that was what had to happen for every patient moving forward. Then we got like a 16 year old guy on a bicycle at the, his bedside, like a stationary bike on high flow nasal cannula. Again, lowest hanging fruit. So we picked the easiest patients first, the patients who are most likely to cooperate, most likely to do well, had the lowest morbidities that could happen. Um, the patient that was intubated that we walked, for example, um, she had a very easy airway. She had no cardiovascular instability and she was basically on like 30% oxygen. So you might argue she was ready to extubate, but that's another, there, there are other reasons she needed to stay intubated, but those are the easy patients. And so you choose the easy patients, you have successes first, and then you start to work together to tackle the more complex patients, but it has to be case by case. And so that by the time you're ready to roll out a more structured program, it's not a foreign concept, I guess is the best way to put it, but you are absolutely right. There were many setbacks. There were many, like we lost, one patient lost a chest tube in the middle of a mobilization one year after we implemented. And we were like, oh my gosh, no one's gonna wanna do pick you up anymore. But they said, you know, it's, it's going to happen. We just have to have a game plan to um, come back from it and not have anything bad happen in the long term. Thank you. So um, uh, uh, another question is on a similar line. And uh, this is, uh, uh, what were your strategies for uh, getting uh, confidence from the family members and what discussion you used to have and when kind of it was, you were building into your program and it was new for the families. And I know once it started, then it's kind of, uh, it, it, it it keeps on transferring from family to family and then it becomes easy. But what were your initial thoughts and strategies to engage families into this process? Because it's mandatory and it's your, your uh, success rate goes way high when you involve family Absolutely. into all this process. So uh, this goes back to what Sebastian was saying. I, you know, initially, I think we all had this notion that families were going to be a barrier at times. But I can tell you in our, and we reported this in our initial QI study, the families were the, the, the probably the least of our issues, right? The families, if you set the expectations early, like any time you just say, yeah, I, I know you all would agree, if you said this to any mom or dad, you know, we want to get your child out of the hospital as quickly as possible and have them um, not lose strength and stay, you know, awake and alert as much as possible because that's what's best for them in the long term. You're hard pressed to find any parent who would be adverse to that. And in fact, the, pa the parents of the chronically critically ill kids 
they were like, oh my gosh, where has this been all our lives? Like we understand the importance of rehab. We understand how important these things are. And for the new parents, the parents who had an unfortunate tragedy or you know diagnosis that landed them in the PICU, if we started on day zero and said, in our PICU, we are going to be opening the shades at nine in the morning or you know, whenever your child normally wakes up in the morning, we're gonna ask you what their routine is during the day. It's really important to us to get the rehab team early. These are all important parts of getting your child well. Parents were never the problem. In fact, I think in the, in, we have an ongoing study right now with almost a thousand patients in it. And I've heard on one hand how many times a parent has been the challenge in getting mobility moving. So it's all staff and cultural change within our own setting. All right. So next question is, can you share a uh, few of your uh, major roadblocks in this journey? Yeah, I think sedation was a major, major roadblock. The whole less is more strategy is it takes a long time to, to build that culture. You know, if you try to tell someone that a baby can be intubated without any sedation on board. Uh, now, we're not talking about like the severe bronchiolytic who desats every time they cough. Like that, those aren't the patients I'm talking about, but we can't automatically assume that every patient needs heavy sedation. And that was what we were, we were that our biggest barrier was how do we get the team to get on board with the fact that this child can be on just morphine and dexmedetomidine. They don't need a benzodiazepine. So that was actually the major thing we had to start low with and start slow with is again, pick an easy patient, take that approach, put a no benzo sign next to their bed and say, this 13 year old who's neurologically completely intact can do without benzos, let's see how it goes. And next thing you know, one patient does well, the next patient does well, it starts to percolate throughout the whole unit. So I, 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 you asked me to pick a few roadblocks, that was the biggest roadblock. If you don't get your sedation situation um, uh, streamlined and also goal oriented, so again, going back to Sebastian, like, you know, the less is more also means titrating the goals. So if you have used validated goals, like the state behavioral score or the RAS score, I don't care what you pick, if it's validated and everyone's using the same language, the kids are going to do better and they're going to get less medication, which I think for the developing brain, we would all agree less is more for sure. Thank you. Uh, Sidra, do you have questions? Yes, I do. Thank you. Those were, I think, perfect responses. Okay, so um, a question that I have from one of the participants is that uh, you mentioned about the times that we usually get our x-rays and bathing done. And uh, if you were to ask us, so it's pretty much the same. We can still see you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. I just want to make sure. Okay. So if you were to ask us, so it's pretty much the same here. So usually during the 5 to 7 a.m. hours is, you know, what it happens. So um, our participant wants to know how easy or difficult was the practice change that you brought about? Or is there like a specific um, timing now in your PQ that you follow with regards to these um, x-rays and these routine investigations? Yeah, no, perfect question. I think uh, also, and I, I'd like to also see what Sebastian says about this, because again, less is more, right? Do we need daily x-rays on every intubated kid? Probably not. Um, and so what we've made very much moved to a everyday discussing, is an x-ray needed tomorrow morning? Um, we do urgent x-rays whenever they need to get done, obviously. That's off the table. But in terms of our daily x-rays, I would be lying to say if I said that it was easy to switch to a 730 model um, because everyone had been doing this for like decades, right? The radiologists had gotten used to reading the x-rays at a certain time. The intensivists had gotten used to sitting down for radiology rounds at 7 a.m. or 7.30. So we just had to propose it and say, can we try a pilot for a month um, where... I think you would all agree, we're all pretty good at assessing whether an ET tube is in the right position or whether there's a new tension pneumo. We don't need a radiologist to tell us those things. So we made a plan with the radiology technicians to come after the nurses had done their shift change. So the shift change, protecting shift change is really important. So seven to 7.45ish. And then um, the texts start coming through the unit at 7.45, get done with x-rays by nine. And so by the time we are done rounding around 1030, then we do radiology rounds with the radiologists. But the nice thing is that all the x-rays are available for urgent 
like looking on rounds if we need to. And then we can always call the radiologist if needed. But I think we just had to get comfortable with the fact that we don't need to talk to the radiologist first thing in the morning. We can wait until later in the day. And now it's just part of our culture. I can't imagine going back ever. Like it's just ingrained now. And now it's also nice because it forces us to finish rounds by 1030. As you all know, some faculty like to round a little longer than others. And so it's nice to like, okay, 1030 is our break point. So that, that's a nice way to go. Sebastian, what, what do you guys do or uh, what is your current um, practice? We are way, way, uh, way back from you. I mean, we are, I would say, in the beginning of the change of our culture for, um, you say, this, the x-rays, we don't usually use uh, x-rays. Right. <laughs> if you have a clinical questions, think about the, the result of that study. If your clinical management or approach would be the same if the x-ray is positive or negative, then don't ask for the, right. exactly. the, the, the study. So I would say that uh, x-ray in particular, when I was a fellow, it, this talk seems like when I was a fellow, well, when I was a fellow, one of my tasks were, was to order the x-ray for the following morning. Today, fellows don't ask routinely for x-rays. That's so, great. To give you that example, uh, we are uh, far away from uh, an active mobility, but we, we have made great advances on family engagement yeah. in the care. Uh, the, infra the, the, the structure of the PACs are not very helpful. You, we are trying to make some changes with the architects, you know, which... Uh, designed the PICUs. I mean, the buildings are really right. hard in many ways. I don't know how did you manage that topic, you know? Many PICU, the boxes where the beds are, are not easy handling, you know, with the beds yeah. to go away. And that, I mean, I cannot imagine the case series you, you gave with one child running in two or three PICU from here. It's really difficult. Mm -hmm. It will pose a harm. So we have we have this culture change. It have to be even considering the architecture, you know, yeah. the architects of the buildings. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Point that point up, and it's important to know because, right, we we in, implemented pick you up after we got our new children's hospital. The, a lot of the things that we did would not be all feasible in the old building that we had, where there's you know all like there were six patients in one room, you know, twelve <clears> patients in another. Uh, so it also depends that one of the roadblocks is often your your physical space. And so clearly that that's a heterogeneous uh, situation across the globe. Yeah. All the, all the PQs from here who, which have changed the practice involving families in daily care, I have a 24 hours policy, you know, visitation policy. They, they have absolutely no regret about it. I mean, family are never a threat on the contrary they are like part of the team they want to and i think uh, and to the to to go back to dr abbas's point about family as potential barriers in fact i think sometimes they're scared to ask whether it's okay to mobilize their child they're scared and i, I can't tell you the number of mothers that we've heard from who then get to know the team, feel comfortable. Like on day 10, they say to us, when we say, oh, would you like to hold your baby today? And they said, oh gosh, I've been meaning to ask that for so long, but I was scared to. Like how hard is it to, for us to hear that a mother was too scared to ask her team if she could hold her baby? Yeah, I get emotional just thinking about it. I have kids, like I just yeah. can't even fathom it, yeah. but it's just not in the top of, in the front of our minds. When we're around a, <clears throat> We're trying to think about how we're going to save this kid's life. How we're going to save this kid's life. How we're going to save this kid's life. <clears throat> but those humanism aspects that I think, let's say the child dies. Many of our patients die. And yeah. if the child dies and the, the mother got to hold that child every day before that child died, how much will that change that family's quality of life moving forward? I will never know, but I can only imagine it will be a huge change. I think it's all about putting the child 
and his or her family in the middle of our attention. Yeah. It's not so difficult. Otherwise, it is difficult, but it should not be. Right. And it's all about confidence. Yes. Between, among the team and between the families and, uh, and us. If the confidence and trust between those actors is broken, then things don't work. Yeah. Medicine is about trust. Sorry, I know we Sebastian and I could go on talking on this call forever. Yeah, so sorry, let, sorry. Let, me, <laughs> let me give it back to you guys. Go ahead. Yeah, that's true. So I had a, a similar question about uh, you covered the radiology part. The participant asked about uh, your negotiation with radiology and, and infection control, as you showed us the video of bring and photos of bringing in a cow or a dog and bringing on those um, bikes, etc. So uh, what were your strategies to win the confidence or, or, or the agreement of radiology to change the timings? Because uh, I know we tried to do this. We were able to change the uh, timing of bath or sponging for the kids from night to morning times when more uh, everybody is around. Uh, but uh, we couldn't do it for the radiology part. So mm -hmm. what, what are your thoughts on that? I think if I think the key is showing as much as although data is limited, objective data about this topic is limited, right? But I think just telling people why you're making this change, right? It's really hard for any special subspecialty to argue with you when you say you're trying to decrease the amount of sedation that children are receiving, optimize their sleep hygiene, and improve patient and family satisfaction. Those things all, I think, are, are critically important. And then um, you mentioned infection control. And again, that's a huge topic in and of itself, especially with COVID. And as you, many of you know, I got deployed to the adult units for the last three months, actually taking care of adult COVID patients. And, um, you know, in the PICU, when we started PICU up, we didn't ask for permission. We just started doing it. <laughs> Because maybe in retrospect, we should have asked infection control what they thought. But, um, you know, like th there's no one really knows. Like, is it, you know, for a child with asthma who's on RSV precautions, for example, to uh, because of droplet precautions to leave the room to go for a walk, you would argue an asthmatic who has all this junk in their lungs that needs to get out is the mo one who needs to walk the most, right? Um, but we keep them in their room, stuck in there because we had to put on a gown to go visit them. And we're seeing the same thing with COVID. The irony is the COVID patients are the most debilitated. However, we're not letting them leave their rooms and we're not letting family come to the bedside. It's like the worst, com complete opposite of everything that Sebastian was talking about, of Zententivus. Zententiv so it, it is a tongue twister, isn't it? Anyway, um, so I, I think those are some things we're really gonna have to think hard about even though it's easy for us to say infection risk is higher if you let patients leave their rooms, the tangible, the intangible impact on the emotional and psychological health and the physical health of these patients, I think is what our adult colleagues are studying actively and we need to, as pediatricians, really start tackling. Because un until we have data, we're not gonna be able to make a case for a lot of these things, including changing the radiologist's minds. Another question that I have is that, um... Another important aspect of your talk was in uh, post-intensive care syndrome. So um, are there any recommendations out there with regards to um, follow up clinics on these kids or following them up? Because we know that life just does not end with discharge uh, from the PICUs or the PICU. So um, how do you go about um, suggesting that? Yeah, so the post-ICU clinics, there's emerging pediatric data, and it's clear that the, the patients that make it to a post-ICU clinic their families love it. They love having someone to talk to. They love having an interprofessional team um, following up with them. The big challenge we have right now in the PICU is because we have such a, like the, the medical ICU on the adult side is different. They have acute respiratory failure patients. Their they're, they're, um, population is much more homogeneous, I guess is the best way to put it. We deal with everything, right? And so uh, well, the hardest part for us is figuring out the selection criteria for who to send to these clinics, and also how do you staff these clinics? And until we get, um, you know, insurance or you know, payment uh, processes for actually get resourcing these clinics, it's really hard to get them set up. So right now, people are setting them up primarily for research purposes, 
But um, the biggest challenge I've been encountering, and I, but again, you got the, the key I want you to take home here is if you guys are doing this work, you need to publish it or talk about it on social media, get it out there because we want to learn from you. And so if you figure out a way to do it successfully and make the hospital happy and the, the staff happy and the patients and families happy, that's no one's going to argue that having a post follow up is a good thing. We just need to show the outcomes are better. And, and you know, that's always and pick you up. That's what I'm working on doing. I'm trying to show that the outcomes are better. I haven't done that yet. I'll be 100% honest. I'm just selling that it's a good thing phenomenon. Hopefully the outcomes will come out soon. Yeah, you absolutely right there. I think it's the evidence that sells eventually. So till the time you don't have any data or evidence to prove it, so nobody's going to buy it. Right, exactly. So, yeah. But this is something that, you know, we've been thinking of as well, but yeah, let's see. I think a lot of people think that like, oh, what I'm doing is so small or oh, it's one center and no one's going to care. Oh man, I mean, what was Pick You Up? Pick You Up was one center QI report. If you look at the actual paper, it's a single center QI. And luckily it got picked up by PCCM, but then all of a sudden people are like, no one's done this before. I need to learn from it and I'm going to not reinvent the wheel. And that's what we want to see globally. That's why I love doing these, um, these talks and these panels because we learn from each other more than anything else. And so we need to share it with the world. Absolutely. Another question from one of our pharmacy colleagues is that since a lot of pediatric critical care is dependent on sedation, so how does one strike a balance between sedation, angelicis, and uh, sleep management? Like if you were to go down on that, so then you, you know, you're kind of preventing delirium, but then again, you know, how do you deal with that? So is there like striking one correct balance? Yeah. Do we have two more hours for this, uh, this panel? <laughs> um, so, oh, I'm really tired. <laughs> so, so the key, the key here is um, if we take an analgesia up, up first approach and not start polypharmacy early, that's the first step. So when a child first hits the unit and they get intubated and they require, uh, they require something, everyone requires something. We can never leave a kid with that ET tube without analgesia for the noxious stimuli of the ET tube. That's a basic minimum. So if it is the easiest thing for the staff to start a low dose morphine infusion, for example, um, we choose morphine in our unit as first line because it's longer acting. Um, and we find that there's less tachyphylaxis, that we're not escalating the morphine as quickly as, for example, fentanyl. And like I said, fentanyl one to two to three to four, you know. Um, so, and also morphine has slightly more sedating properties. Fentanyl is a horrible sedative. If you take anything away from me today, fentanyl is not a sedating drug unless you give massive doses and cause apnea. So morphine can have that um, advantage. Um, another approach is for the teenagers, give them control. Give them a, a patient controlled analgesia button. Give them something where they can push the button when they have pain. And then outside of that, dexmedetomidine, if you have access to it, is a beautiful thing. Um, it maintains respiratory drive. So the morphine dexmedetomidine is our, um, our usual initial approach. If we need a third agent, we often start enteral valium if needed. Enteral Valium has much lower risk of delirium than IV midazolam infusions. There's no question, IV midazolam is the worst thing you can do, but if you have to use something else, Enteral Valium, met Enteral Methadone is also another option. The key is you don't want to slam these receptors every single millisecond with medication. You want them there to be a nice steady state that's created, but without exposing the child to more drug than needed. But we can do a two hour lecture later about, and a discussion about different strategies for approaching that. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Bas, you have questions? No, yeah. just to make yeah. a point. Yeah, go ahead. That we were talking about a few minutes ago. I don't person, personally think that we need evidence to let the families go in. Oh, absolutely not. They have the right to be with yes. their kids. We don't need a randomized controlled trial to <laughs> prove that families are good. Yeah. <laughs> if, if we all have kids, hopefully, and we know that if they get the flu, they are with their parents. They need them. Mm -hmm. So now, why are we asking for more evidence or stronger evidence to let the families in? Yeah. I'm really worried about this. I mean, we, we assume that we have the power to, to get them out, and we don't have it. We so, don't, Sebastian, we shouldn't have it. 
Uh, or I guess I can ask Sidra and Kalab, um, what is the um, family visitation policies where you are? Like, so, so for example, in the U.S. in Park Picu, all 82 ICUs allow 24-hour family presence. Um, what is your experience there? Uh, so, over the, uh, if we talk about, uh, for example, for the last five years, so over the passage of time, initially it was kind of very restricted. If the rounds are happening, parents can't come. Mm. And, and then, then we we have a culture, you know, about our uh, subcontinent culture that extended family members want to visit. But uh, as of now, for our kind of past couple of years, what we have developed is uh, unrestricted family. Uh, and by family, I mean parental uh, bondage with the child. So they, they can come at any time, 24-7. Uh, but not for the extended family members. So this is what we are doing. But if we talk about overall culture in, in uh, our city or in, in Pakistan, majority of the physicians are kind of scared to let parents uh, allow to be with their family. But we have kind of succeeded, succeeded to overcome this barrier. Yeah, that's great. And it's, it, all it takes is one champion within one unit to say, yeah. to start showing that it works and then... And then the next step, once you allow them to be at the bedside, then is how do you engage them? And, you know, how do you get them right. more involved? So, yeah, Sebastian's point is really important. Yeah. And we've also started involving them during the rounds now. Initially, right. there was this concept that you'll actually talk to them towards the end of your rounds and all. But, and, you know, like as we just discussed that, you know, families, rather than being barriers, are actually very supportive of the fact that you involve them in their child's care. Oh, so yeah. I think that's been, yeah, so that's been a good change for us. So we started involving them. It's kind of part, um, and, you know, in bits and all, but we started heading towards that direction. So I think that's been a good change. Oh, that's a huge change because I think Sebastian would agree, like how much we learn from the parents on rounds often, it can be like, it can change the kid's care completely, right? Um, we learn, they know their kid best. And, and I, I did want to emphasize for delirium, and this is for COVID, this has been our biggest challenge in the adult world, is families know their, their loved one best. And when you don't have that person saying, my fit loved one isn't, isn't right, something's not right, can you scream, you know, is, are they, that, often they are the people who tell us their loved one is delirious. And so we don't have those tools now often in COVID. So we need to rely on objective tools, but also call if family can't come to the bedside or can't be there. And also socioeconomically, we have to acknowledge that some families can't be at the bedside because their, their work, their jobs. Um, and we found in Park PQ that's, that's been a challenge. Um, we have to find other ways. We need to call them and give them updates. And also we need to be cognizant of asking them, what was your child or loved one like before they came to the hospital? Because in the adult world, I'm learning, like, I'm learning that these people who are completely normal, functional, um, like, doing everything on their own are, like, completely shells of themselves. But I would have assumed that maybe they had issues beforehand. So you have to talk to your, the family members to find out what was their baseline before they came. Yeah. The two more so, precise and important devices for monitoring the critically ill children are parents and nurses. Mm -hmm. If you don't have them in your team, you are blind. Yeah, yeah. So we are uh, just getting uh, a little over time. So is it okay that we finish a couple of more questions before we call it today? Is yeah, it fine? This is, the, this is a longer session, and we have like you know quite a bit of questions. Now. Okay. So is it sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. Dr. Basco. Yeah. So I have a question for both of you, and this basically uh, touches on evidence-based medicine, as Sebastian mentioned, versus a protocolized medicine, for example, a protocol, sedation, um, sedation protocol, et cetera, versus an individualized uh, medicine or uh, take, taking everything to that individual's need. So what, 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 what's your the best mix of all this? How do we go about that? And what's their role in changing uh, culture in a unit to, to bring, I mean, the whole uh, evidence-based or be bringing research as a standard of care into one's uh, unit and culture. Sebastian, you go, you go first. Yeah. I mean, evidence-based medicine, it's about uh, individualizing, you know. You have to be aware of the available evidence and then you have to decide what what you have if you have evidence to treat some particular patient. Uh, these recommendations, like one 
seats for all does not work in the PACU. So you have to be aware, you have to, be, uh, to have a culture of uh, uh, research within your PACU that improve the application of evidence-based medicine, but it is not a panacea, you know. Finally, you will have to decide what you have to do, but evidence-based medicine, it's about it. It's all about it. It's about individual, individualizing the therapies and each intervention. And when you don't have a response from the evidence, from the available evidence, my take is first, do no harm. If you, have, if you are doubtful about, if you are going to use some medication, first, do no harm. If you are not sure, don't use it. I mean, pharmacon, that Greek word says it all. It, pharmacon means poison and means remedy. You never know if you, if you use a, a, a medication in a single person and you, you don't have precise evidence of this, if you use it, you are flipping a coin. So uh, in this pandemic, we have seen all of that and that triggered uh, the writing of that paper, you know. Yeah, I, and I, I don't have much to add other than with regards to the question of, you know, one of the first questions I get after my talks is, you know, so uh, should, we, should we have a sedation protocol or what is, the, what is the right next step? So we don't actually still at Johns Hopkins and our PICU do not have a sedation protocol. And there might be some of my colleagues that um, take issue with that or would prefer that we have one. And then I know that the nurses often sometimes would prefer that there's a nurse titrated protocol so they don't feel like they have to call every time you know, they need additional sedation. However, what we found is that satisfier, that need to develop a sedation protocol decreased significantly once we created this culture of less is more and illness not stillness. Because as soon as people recognize that you can have patients more awake, they're less delirious, more likely to mobilize, um, and frankly, a lot more fun to take care of. So I think the other thing is, you know, and I'm an anesthesiologist also, so let me tell you, it is much easier to take care of a completely anesthetized patient than, for example, a gentleman having a prostatectomy under a spinal who's constantly talking to you, right? Like that's a, th there's two different uh, approaches, but at the same time, in the long term in the PICU, it is a lot easier to take care of a lucid teenager who is writing on a whiteboard and trying to get your attention than a delirious teenager who is trying to pull out all their lines and tubes and doesn't know, you know what they're doing because they're agitated. So once we created this culture and people started to see that you could find the happy medium, um, we erred away from creating a sedation protocol because I felt that it was important for our trainees, we're you know academic hospital, it was important for our trainees to learn different ways of doing things. There's not just one way, there's just not the Dr. Kuchetka way of morphine and dex, like there's other ways. And so as long as you use the same strategy of less is more and go low, uh, start low, go slow, we let people prescribe what they think is appropriate. So some doctors love fentanyl. They love fentanyl infusions. They're always going to use a fentanyl infusion. That's fine. Um, but we do have a pathway and suggestions, friendly suggestions, but um, we don't have a protocol just because it seems to be working. All right. Thank you. So Sapna, um, this is a question from my side. Uh, did you do a cost analysis uh, pre-post uh, your park ICU um, uh, QI project? I mean, yeah, we we didn't do a formal cost analysis. However, um, we we did realize that the, another question I get a lot is, what about staffing? Like, how did you make this work with the same number of people, right? Um, because no one gave you money, no one gave you staff. And so it was a lot of creativity. It was a lot of hard work on the part of the staff. And you have to find people that are going to own this, champions. You have to have a nursing champion, a respiratory therapy champion, a physical therapy champion. These people who are willing to go the extra mile initially to do something they're passionate and excited about. And I think what you'll find is um, another huge take home. And I know Sebastian will agree. We don't, I don't think we tell our interprofessional colleagues how much we value them how much they bring to the table. And I think we're a very um, physician-centric 
specialty in general, no matter how you cut it. And, um, you know, whether or not people consider it a hierarchy or whatnot, I, you know, every day, I just, I, I, I thank God that I know that my, my team brings so much to the table every single day. And I'm not a rehab expert. I talk about the importance of it, but that's not my, what I train to do. But my physical and occupational therapy, speech language pathologists, they train to do this. This is what they do. So I think that um, creating value is creating value within the staff. If you make people feel valued, you will be so impressed with what they're willing to do because they know that someone cares and appreciates what they're doing and it's making a difference in the patient's lives. So now that three, a few years after Pick You Up, we've shown that um, we're improving outcomes and that, you know, our patients are using less sedation and that they are, um, you know, again, their data is emerging, but they are get, staying intubated uh, less long. We were able to procure more full-time physical and occupational therapy staff. So that makes a huge difference because obviously then you can send more staff to the units. You don't overwhelm and burden the staff. So not, no cost analysis has been done yet, but um, the adult, our adult colleagues, Dale Needham at Hopkins, my adult compadre, uh, they've done it. Uh, they've definitely shown that it, it decreased costs. So there's, there's no question it has an impact and there's no reason to think it would be otherwise in the PICU. Uh, back to you, Sidra. Thank you, Dr. Bas. Okay, so two last questions before we close. So one question for both of you is that, you know, in this day and age, especially given the COVID circumstance, so how does um, one deal with all the information bias that exists? You know, there's just something that comes in every day. And, you know, so how does one kind of deal with all of this? So that is a question. I think it's an important question. But Very fine. Go ahead, Sebastian. <laughs> well, this, how do we handle this noise? Okay. I think the most important thing in medicine is trust your colleagues. So... The, the hashtags, you know, that prepared Sabna a few months ago are really useful. I mean, COVID-19 and PEDS EQ have, have been a wonderful pathway to, to be aware of what is worthwhile and what it is not. I mean, you have to be uh, in contact with your, your fellows. Uh, just... Um, openly uh, talk about this. Uh, I mean, there is a lot of noise. There are uh, really good papers about this, uh, how to handle it. But I, I personally stick to my best colleagues. I ask them for uh, advice, what is worthwhile to read and what is not. I, 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 I really... I, I've been really uh, close to my mentors and to my friends and my families. Um, it's important to speak out what you think, to ask for advice and for feedback from your colleagues. Are we doing this okay or not? I mean, uh, it's really difficult this time during this time to, to avoid rushing into novel things. We, I think it's really important to stick to do what you, what you know that you do good, uh, good. And so sudden change of practices are not advisable from my side, from my point of view. Same happens with where do you read the information? When do you study? I, I haven't changed that. I mean, I stick to my colleagues and I trust them. And if uh, three months ago, my fellows from Europe told me, hey, this COVID thing is not a, a Chinese story, you know, then I, I had to trust them. So we have, if you, if you break trust among our community, you are in severe problems. Same happens right now where Latin America is the hotspot. It's like the epicenter. Same happens in the South of North America. Yeah. So I tell, I tell, I, I, I listen to them. I trust them. If they say to me, hey, you have to do this or that, trust me, this is, this is hard or we are doing good. I mean, it's really useful. I, I haven't changed a lot. Yes. I, I, I agree with everything Sebastian just said. And I, 
the, the beauty of the PEDS critical care community, we're, we're a small community in the grand scheme of things, right? Compared to the adult critical care community, we're a small community and we found that through social media, like, you know, no matter how much we, it, we, we have a huge footprint, but the nice thing is it's, it's, it's still kind of, you still feel like you have a home and you're not getting lost in, yeah. in this massive um, international community. So that being said, I think in the PEDS critical care community, for the most part, it's just all about curating your content and making sure that you know who, who you trust. Like Se Sebastian said, like that, you know, if you go on social media, which is a great source of information, but also can be a source of misinformation. I won't mention some of my um, US leaders, et cetera, that may be contributing to that phenomenon, but you know, you, you can figure out uh, quickly who you can trust and who you can't and whose, whose opinions you respect. If people are out there kind of mandating the, there's only one way, they're probably not as trustable as someone who's giving logical, pragmatic expertise on their experience. So if you're not on social media, you're interested in checking that out, um, please do just come on and just, just follow me and Sebastian. Between me and Sebastian and your amazing moderators here, you will find um, a bunch of people to follow that are trustable, verifiable people in the area. And, and it's just, you know, use your judgment. You guys are all amazing clinicians. Use your judgment. You'll know when the red flag should go up about this, this message maybe isn't something I should be listening to. And as we've learned back to basics in the first month of this pandemic, everyone was being very anti, um, anti less is more, I think is the best way to put it. But we learned very quickly as Wes Ely, one of the guys who talks so much about this is less is more back to basics. Let's not forget what we do well. And as pediatricians, we do this so well. Family centered care is what we do. Yeah. And we have so much to offer our adult colleagues um, and, and, and to teach the world about how do you take care of the child family unit or the patient family unit. I think that's remember that we're not just we're just not um, pediatric providers. We we know the whole spectrum. I think I'm biased, of course, but I think that we get it in a, in a very comprehensive way. Yes, a single and novel virus cannot change the way we practice medicine. It is not such an important uh, virus, you know. It changed the world. Okay, it's right. Not so important, COVID. Did perhaps, you hear perhaps, perhaps Samna recalls, I think it was late March, we have a WhatsApp group, you know, for coordination from PCCM, and I freely uh, ask them, well, where are, we, where are you reading from? How can we manage it? And they, well, we read from the, the, the same places we usually read. Mm -hmm. So exactly. I, I have to trust them. So that's a, a precious thing in medicine. You, can, you have to, to find your uh, peers, you have to trust your mentors, and you have to strengthen your bonds, especially du during a, a pandemic. And, and I would be remiss, Sebastian and I would both be remiss if we didn't mention, in addition to the four of us on this call, um, to also follow PCCM, the journal, because uh, yeah. there's a, amazing content coming out of there. And in my experience, uh, the Lancet Child Adolescent Health, um, Gemma Pediatrics, and obviously the New England Journal have all published really great, um, you know, high impact work on COVID in addition to all of the pediatric journals out there. So um, please, uh, in addition to pediatrics, of course, where Sebastian's cake study just came out, so lots of options. Just start slowly but surely observing what's out there and use your judgment. I think it's absolutely flattering to be part of, you know, global um, fraternity, like, and be amongst you all. So I think it's, it's a big privilege for us sitting here. So one last question, Sapna, is we uh, do have dexmedetomidine here, and I agree, and Dr. Bas would agree, it's, it's a beautiful drug. So there's this question on the role of clonidine as an opioid sparing. How do you see that uh, with the dex? already there is and um, how do you think you know what role clonidine has to play yeah clonidine has multiple roles i love clonidine we actually have a pilot study looking at um iv clonidine iv not um infusions but actually intermittent clonidine boluses in in lieu of dexmedetomidine because if you you know you all know dexmedetomidine and clonidine are both alpha 2 receptors except the affinity of the alpha-2 receptor for dexmedetomidine is, you know, in the hundred times higher than clonidine. So um, you tend to develop more um, physiologic withdrawal with dexmedetomidine infusions than clonidine. So um, 
clonidine has two roles in my view. Uh, we won't talk about it as a first line drug because I think most people aren't ready to take on that role, but um, clonidine and methadone can both be used as an opportunity to minimize the escalation in the dexmedetomidine infusion. So, um, you know, do not increase your dexmedetomidine infusions above 1.5, for example, or whatever your dosing regimen is. But the um, approved adult dosing for dexmedetomidine is 0.7 um, mics per kick per uh, hour. So, you know, again, 1 to 1.5 is more than we should be doing in peds because then as you escalate, the, you're hitting a wall. So clonidine can be used um, early on, even day two or day three. If you're seeing the dex infusion is going up rapidly, you can start initiating enteral clonidine, um, Q6 hours or even Q4 hours in some cases to minimize how high you go on the infusion. So that's in the escalation phase, but you can also use clonidine in the weaning phase so that you can get the kid off of the infusion and get them out of the ICU. Uh, I don't know if you guys allow dexmedetomidine infusions outside of the ICU, we do not. So often you have these kids sitting around on dexmed in the PICU, which is unfortunate, right? Um, so we start clonidine in that role as well. And then clonidine can also be an opioid sparing medication and help you wean off of the morphine and fentanyl drips that you started also. So clonidine is a beautiful drug and because it's a, it, it has less alpha-2 infinity affinity, um, there's also less of that um, physiologic withdrawal phenomenon. I think that's wonderful. So we're almost roughly two hours into our discussion. I think this is the longest that we've gone so far. It's about, yeah, yeah so it's almost 7 p.m. here and probably like 9 a.m. there at your yeah. end. Okay, so uh, Dr. Bas, do we have any further questions that we can uh, no. close for today? Yeah. Okay, so once again, we would want to thank you for being with us, giving your time. I think it's been a greater honor, privilege uh, for all of us to have you here. And we look forward to having you again. Thank you so much Thanks. for having us. Thank you. Thank you, Sapna. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Thank you. Thank bye you, bye. Sapna. Thank you, Sebastian. Nice to meet you. Nice bye to bye. meet you. Bye Thank bye. you, guys. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So good evening and take care. And okay. tomorrow, then tune in to Dr. Akash's session. He happens to be the director of the Pediatric Intensive Care Unit, King's College, London. And he'll be talking to us regarding AKI and critically ill child with COVID-19, clinical approach and management. So thank you once again for joining us. Good evening and take care. Take care. Bye. Thank bye, you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye, Samna. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye.